Greetings, greetings. Uh, this is the first Liberty, Justice, and Peace gathering. I, I got them out of order once, and John corrected me on that. So, <laughs> um, and the w- one thing to keep. Yeah, my name is Jack Shemek. I've been in the libertarian movement since about 1969, and. Uh, in various different capacities, and I won't go into all of that right now. So what I want to do is, you know, share some of my observations, and I'm going to push my particular agenda. And you don't have to agree with it. I just ask for you to, you know, think about it. Like a lot of times we tend to, like in the libertarian movement, there's a lot of people that have real strong beliefs about something, and as soon as you say something, they want to argue with you, and, and you know, it's a knockdown, drag out, and. Um, You'll have your own time. Just sign up on the sign-up sheet. <laughs> um, so, so there will be some controversial views, and I want to lay out the, some real controversial ones right off the bat. Um, for my own beliefs and my position, uh, I'm actually opposed to liberty, and I think justice doesn't exist, and I think there will never be peace. And on top of that, I think that ideas don't matter. So those ought to be some good controversial things to start off with. But let me explain. (laughs) The reason I say that I'm opposed to liberty is that I think liberty... I'm opposed to the use of the word liberty as our main driving word. I'm for the use of the word freedom. Liberty is less of a concept. Freedom is more all-encompassing. So yeah, of course I'm in favor of liberty. uh, But... I'm in favor of the use of the word freedom. So a lot of times when I organize something, I call it the freedom something or other instead of the liberty something or other. Liberty implies um, the freedom to move around. It's one of the freedoms. Um, so, for example, when a sailor is at liberty, that means he can get off of the ship. Uh, when you know someone is put in prison, they, they take away his liberty right, his right to go as he pleases. But they don't take away his right to life. And um, prisoners, for example, they don't take away your right to own something. They actually own their, you know, their commissary account. They own the, maybe the TV they bought with uh, you know, their commissary money. Uh, they can still own their home and things like that. So they don't take away your, your right to own things uh, and your right to life, but they do take away your liberty. So liberty is like a much smaller concept than freedom. So that's what I mean when I say I'm against uh, liberty. So don't worry. Uh, the reason I say justice doesn't exist is that I think justice is something that we do. Uh, justice is a concept that people come up with uh, to say that uh, essentially the outcome was right or was fair. Um, but justice doesn't exist. We have to create justice in everything that we do. So again, it doesn't exist out in the world. The world just has stuff. Justice is something that happens between individuals. So what we're trying to do, I think, is learn how to be just with each other and what to do when someone does something that's unjust to us to make the situation resolve to where it's just. Um, The reason I say uh, peace will never exist is that, or that there will never be peace, is that peace is a... A uh, totally all-encompassing concept that means there's no violation of anybody's rights, zero. So uh, there's no crime, there's no injustice. Um, a lot of times people think of peace just in the terms of war and peace. You know, peace is when the soldiers stop shooting, but they actually have you know justices of the peace. You know, peace officers uh, disturbing the peace. And that's when somebody is doing something that's wrong and they've essentially um, upset the peace. The peace being a condition where nobody's rights are violated. So the the only reason I say there will be no peace is that we'll never get to perfection. But peace, though, is our mission. Peace is what we're aiming for. Peace is the target, the, um, the goal, or that sort of thing. It's kind of like heading west, but... Uh, Well, it's more like um, if I had a chart in in science, they talk about um, uh, an asymptotic condition is the the math word, where something, like if you go halfway to San Francisco, okay, you end up somewhere and you say, okay, my next day I'm going to go halfway to San Francisco, so now you end up in 
Colorado or something, then you say, I'm going to go halfway. If you're only ever going halfway, you actually never get there. You're always like that kind of thing. Uh, so you're approaching it. So we can approach it, and I want to talk a little bit later about you know how to measure some of these things, because I think that's something we need to do. Uh, the last controversial thing I said is that ideas don't matter. And it's like, what? We're the libertarian movement. It's all about ideas. It's all about you know, figuring things out, what's the right thing. The reason I say that is, again, this is kind of a trick, um, it's action that matters. And, the, of course, the ideas fuel our motivation that makes us act. And so, of course, ideas are important. And I just made a tiny little semantic distinction. They don't matter because if you did nothing with the ideas, there's plenty of folks that are on the Internet all the time and never leaving their mom's basement and, and they never do anything. So um, their, their ideas don't so much matter as... Um, you know, the people that went out in Liberation Square in Egypt, you know, and, and toppled their government. So, God, that makes me cry when I think about that. Um, so, with those views out of the way, I'm going to cover a few other things um, and into my own beliefs and uh, some of my recommendations for the movement. And I'm saying this as someone who's been involved in observing it for like 42 uh, years now. Um, I, this is a funny story. I got involved in the libertarian movement because I learned later that I, I sort of have a sleep disorder. I don't sleep well at night or whatever, so I'm tired during the day. And I went to a big university that had 500 people sitting in the uh, history class auditorium because history was a required course. So everybody went through this mill and it was a you know, professor way, way down there, and I always got got there late, and I sat on the back row, the far right-hand seat, and the guy next to me, I kept falling asleep, and I would lean over against him. Well, it turns out he was um, a big Ayn Rand fan, and we became good friends, and he told me, oh, you should read this, and then there was a, a, a group there called the Objectivism Study Group, and so that was the first thing I got involved in. I was still, you know, new, and I I was... Uh, just so curious and I was reading everything and this is interesting, it's 1969, it's the year after Ayn Rand and Nathaniel Brandon had a you know, big split up and so I didn't know about that and I didn't know what was going on in the movement but 1969 was actually a, a big crucial year in the libertarian movement not just because I, that's the year I entered it but a bunch of other interesting stuff happened. Um, so we find that uh, in the world around us and, and in our movement, there's, there's a lot of um, anger about the way the world is, and there's a lot of discontent, and sometimes there's just depression and hopelessness about it. And I've wondered about that, I've felt it myself, and I've wondered why and what do we do about it. Um, so the, my talk today is called Context and Consequences. So I think if we understand the context of our world better, and if we understand our actions and what the consequences of them are, we can actually hone in better on the question of what should I do and what, what to do. Uh, what's the best use of my time? How can I better uh, further freedom? So now I'm going to tell you a l real personal story about uh, context and consequences. Um, 1978, I was in uh, New York City. It was June. It was a real nice night. Uh, it, was, it was near midnight, but it's still a real pleasant night. And I was walking down the street, and uh, this guy comes up to me and says, Give me a dollar. And he's kind of a tough looking guy and all that. And I'm going, I'm carrying a cardboard box. And I'm going, Man, I just got out of federal prison. This, this number on the front of my box, that's my prisoner number. I just need a break. And I'm just trying to get, uh, I'm just trying to get home. So he said, uh, oh, yeah, sure, man, sure. So <clears throat> how did that happen? You know, how did I end up at like 28 years old, 29 years old, walking down New York City at midnight with a cardboard box, just having gotten out of federal prison? Um, 
that's an interesting story of misunderstanding the context and not being aware of how serious the consequences were going to be. Um, I had had all this energy, and this this happens uh, when you're young. You get like really enthused, and you'll just do anything. And the the context of the the world is, yeah, we do. I'm going to go way more into the context of how the world really is, but there are certain things in the um, the governmental system that they're real serious about. And the context is, uh, with the tax system, there's something like, I don't know, 15 million people that um, don't file. It's a huge, huge number. But um, they will target people. And they do that so that, you know, they make some examples. And they don't have infinite resources, so they have to pick a few people. For example, a few years ago, they picked um, Leona Helmsley because she was, you know, a high-profile person and she'd done something on her tax returns it didn't like, so they actually put this really wealthy woman in, in prison. I'm not sure what she did to piss them off, but here's what I did to, to piss off the authorities in general. I had, um, when I'd gotten out of college, I actually, um, I got a job with some objectivists. Uh, I, I found my job in the back pages of Reason Magazine. And by the way, when I first got into this movement in 69 and 70, um, Reason Magazine was mimeographed and stapled in the corner. So uh, it, was, it was an exciting time. We were passing around this like Sami's Dot kind of underground thing, it seemed like. But I got this job. I was working for these libertarians, and I became an accidental activist. And the way that worked, I was, I was doing everything kind of in the libertarian movement. We, the guys I worked with... Um, uh, they were into uh, gold, and this was back when gold is nowhere near the price it is today. So we would order gold coins. Um, I actually bought a little car, a really nice Alfa Romeo, with some gold coins, and we used Austrian ducats then. So I bought it for like 39 Austrian ducats. And one day, I worked as a draftsman at the time. I left my, uh, my wallet on the uh, drafting table, and I went out driving, and I got stopped, and... I just didn't know the laws in that state, and I, <clears throat> I hadn't registered it in the right time frame and gotten it inspected, and I left my wallet at work. So I got a ticket for no driver's license, no inspection sticker, and no registration. And I was angry. I was a libertarian. They can't do this to me. I got a right to travel. <laughs> and uh, so I was going to fight it, you know. And back then, I was in the mode of fighting everything. And I want to talk about that a little bit, too. Uh, so I was I was fighting this thing, and I I got you know of course convicted because that's the way the system is then, and that's the way it is now. Um, I appealed it. Um, I think I got the paperwork for the appeal. Then I had to file it with a, a constable's office or something like that. And I got it there like you know quarter of midnight, slipped it in their mail slot or something on the on the last day of the deadline. Uh, and they didn't count it till the next day. So they went and arrested me, threw me in county jail. And uh, so they kind of manhandled me a lot of different ways, and I went back around to, uh, you know, to question them, and they says, oh, well, they said nasty things to me. We'll take care of you. We'll show you who's boss in this town and that kind of stuff. It was really kind of like out of the movies. They were, they were such toughs. So I, I, I had a friend in the libertarian movement who was a lawyer, and I asked him, what can I do? And he says, well, you can file a federal civil rights lawsuit. So I sued this policeman, this constable, and this judge, and like six or eight of them at home. And this is, of course, before word processors, and I'm typing it all, and I sue them all in federal court. And I didn't really know what I was doing, but I really made some big waves. They don't often get sued, you know, for civil rights violations. And the upshot of this, this is getting back to the story of how I ended up in, on the streets of New York. Uh, the, uh, I was fighting everything, so one of the other things I was doing had to do with my, my taxes and everything. And it was actually a real minor thing. It was like a signature on this one form. But the way the, the, the context of the world is, the law enforcement, police, judges, all these folks, they're in a brotherhood, and they talk to each other. And so I had made such waves, they essentially said, hey, check this guy out, see if you can find something on him. And they did. They found this little thing on the, the signature form. And 
they arrested me at work one day and in fact it was the day before I was moving to New Hampshire I had the truck rented it was my last day on the job they actually went to my place of business and arrested me there um, I did get bailed uh, I was released on the, my bond was that I could I could go from that state to New Hampshire and back and forth to just to go to court but I couldn't go anywhere else but of course, I don't know the inside, but I have a feeling that I got busted for this because I had made such big waves. Um, so, in the end, I, I suffered those consequences. I wasn't um, sentenced for very long because it wasn't a very serious crime or anything like that, but it, it has a way of throwing a real kink in your life. Um, I won't go into all the details of that, but just just to to tell people in the movement that there are things that you can do that uh, can, can create really serious consequences and you've got to consider that in your actions. And I'm, going to, I'm going to get into that a little more too. Um, here's uh, another example of what I just talked about of uh, myself kind of waking a sleeping dog. You know, I, I came, I bubbled to the top because I was causing so much trouble. Uh, back during the days of the draft, there was a move to, uh, well, a lot of people were burning their draft cards and things like that. And, uh, or, uh, I can't remember exactly which things, but there, there was only nine people, anyway, accused of um, <clears throat> breaking the law in regards to the draft. And guess what? Each one of those nine had written a letter to the Selective Service and they said, I'm not going to you know, get a selective service card or I'm not going to show up on it for the draft. No, in other words, they sort of turned themselves in. They they raised their profile to the point where... They find their own yeah, essentially. So, those are um, just some things to think about. Um, so I wanted to get that personal thing out because, you know, like if I if I'm... If I choose not to be involved in some particular libertarian action, I might be judging it as to either not be effective or, or have the wrong kind of consequences that I don't want. And I only say that, I'm not you know, bragging about that history. I probably uh, made some bad judgment, but it you know, helped me learn a few things. Um, so just in case somebody um, wonders if I've paid my dues, I, I did uh, a couple of times there. Oh, I, I was in the county jail about six or eight other times because I was also fighting the, we had a borough sales tax and we had a state sales tax and uh, I think there was a county sales tax. I fought every one of them. I ended up going to jail for just about every one. I fought on recording and back then it was before video recordings. I just had a little cassette recorder. I just wanted to record what they said. So I went in the county jail about six or eight times too. So so what's, what's all that all about? The anger, you know? I was, I was so angry and I, I believed, you know, they can't do this to me. And that's because I believed in what I call the civics class mythology. Um, and I wrote down some of the things that I learned in my, uh, my civics class that, that was essentially a mythology. Uh, it was basically that um, America is the best country in the world. Um, you know, the laws here are made by the people. Um, the United States is the most fair country in the world where people are equal. Um, our government really does good. You know, our government's different when there's a war. Our army doesn't, you know, rape and pillage just like all the other countries do. There was this teaching of what they call American exceptionalism. We're different, you know. We're so much better and we have rights and we can go to court and the court will give us justice. And um, did I hear? More um, so anyway, I believe the civics class mythology, but the, here's the thing to remember when I talk about context, what's our world really like? The civics class is, it's propaganda. It's, it's something that's taught to um, create, you know, a belief structure to make people behave a certain way, all this, you know, all the different purposes of propaganda. It's not a critical evaluation of how the world really is. Um, so, so I was angry. I, you know, I would. The reason I fought all these things, I says, you can't do that. That's not right. 
the Constitution says blah blah blah. And so that was my anger because I was fighting this battle about what I'd been told about what America is and what I was seeing on the streets, you know, with the police and the constables. In this town they still called them uh, constables, magistrates. They had kind of this old terminology for stuff. So I talked about there's anger and discontent and depression and, and sadness. Well, I, I think I finally figured out what the sadness part is, too. Um, in, in our movement, a lot of people, uh, we, we read a lot and we discover, you know, how bad things really are. And I don't want to focus on how bad things they are, but how bad things are. But I, I, got, I do this thing in Nashville called the Freedom Forum, and we've met every Wednesday night for about, I think, 17 years now. And this one guy came in and admitted that, that he was so upset the more and more he learned about how, how bad things are that he reached a point where he just didn't want to get out of bed. He says he was almost curled up in the fetal position in bed and didn't want to go anywhere. And he just, he was kind of coming out of it. And I said, you know, I've, I've noticed that before, that it's so depressing to hear all this stuff that a lot of people just don't even want to hear it because they know they're going to be depressed. So I think that what's happening is people are mourning the loss, the death of the America that they thought they lived in. And they're mourning that the civics class mythology wasn't, had died, it wasn't really true. Now, the thing is, if they had learned the truth from the beginning, they wouldn't have had this loss. They wouldn't have had this mourning and this depression. If somebody had told them how the world really is, and this is the context, um, and you can fill in some other stuff, but I'm going to highlight it. The world really is, and this includes America, um, it's run by an oligarchy of rich and powerful elite. Um, the, the rulers or the elected leaders, <clears throat> the political leaders in most of our countries are so sociopaths and mass murderers. Um, they'll lie and deceive to advance their careers. They don't, I don't know if anybody's seen this George Carlin clip, he, he says, they don't give a about you, you know. They don't care. They're going to take all your money. They're going to—I can't remember his words—but if you just look up George Carlin, it'll probably be the top hit. It's like who owns, who, who really controls the United States, or something like that. Yeah, he calls them the owners. Yeah, yeah. So, um, if somebody had told me that, and also the the, the national leaders are probably worse, and they're the most uh, corrupt because there's so much at stake. They can be bribed with so much more money. Uh, but it trickles down to the state and local level. They're corrupt, not that the individuals are corrupted, but they're corrupted in why they're really there. And so this whole structure is a structure of people that are really serving this oligarchy, uh, this wealthy elite that essentially want to control the world. And the, when I say the locals are corrupted in their beliefs, they're, you know, the police departments are doing things now so that uh, they'll get more federal money. They forget about the fact that they really should be there to serve and protect their, their community, like some of their logos actually say. But they're not. So the co real context of the world is that, and also the intellectuals and the social movements are not honest. They're bribed and paid too. Uh, a lot of things came out about um, the Koch brothers recently, about them financing the Tea Party movement. Well, Sam Konkin points out in the New Libertarian Manifesto that the Koch brothers um, actually, you know, injected money into the libertarian movement. So even the libertarian movement is is corrupted by money, and and they uh, steer the movement to some extent through money because people always want, um, you know, money for paying their office rent, paying their staff, things like that. And. <clears throat> There's, there's, a, there's a good passage where this is described back in the 20s in the book Tragedy and Hope. Um, Carol Quigley writes, uh, he describes how the Morgan uh, Bank worked. Not how they worked banking, but how they used money to manipulate social movements. They actually, um, they had people on their staff go to essentially every meeting that was going on in New York. And they tried to gauge... Um, how the policies of that group would affect them. And if, if one of the 
one of these nutty social movements, if something would really, if it was passed into law, if it would help the Morgans, they'd give them a little more money. And now they could get a printing press. They'd give them a little more money. They could get an office. If some other group um, had some notion that was uh, not helpful to them, they'd say, you know, they don't give them any money. So they actually are sort of behind the scenes pulling the levers by how much money they deal out to these different people. If one of the groups, you know, changes a policy and, and it goes against the Morgans in, then they withhold money from them and, oh, they can't afford their office anymore. They have to close, things like that. So, so even the intellectual and social movements um, are corrupted and behind the scenes there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, and in, the truth of it is the context of essentially all of our, I call it the infrastructure of living is corrupted. The money system, money and banking. I, don't, I won't even go into the Federal Reserve. Most people in here know all about that. The education system, the National Education Association was essentially started by the Rockefellers. There's all kinds of other interests in the education system other than teaching kids stuff. Um, the food chain, you know, there's all kinds of bioengineering and, uh, you know, um, chemicals added to the food chain. There's a whole, you know, movement that's, that's, that's been aware of that for a while, the health food type of movement. Um, what I'll try to do for the, uh, the video is make up a slide of this. I have a chart where you look at all the ways you interact uh, and it's either taxed, regulated, completely corrupted behind the scenes. So, for example, if they had told me all of this, all of this context in my civics class, I wouldn't have gone through the sadness and the mourning for the loss of the America that they told me about. Now, <clears throat> for example, uh, you know, maybe the... Uh, I don't know, I can't, I can't speak for the average Russian under the Soviet Union, but they, they all knew that Pravda and his Vestia were lying to them, you know? No. And they knew that if... They said, they said there's no truth in Vestia, yeah, yeah. no news in Pravda. Right. But they all knew that if it was put in the paper, then the opposite was true, essentially. So, <clears throat> essentially, we'll, we will succeed in having a better touch with our reality, if we just understand this whole context, we don't live in the America that they taught us in our civics classes. That was propaganda. And that, that alone actually makes you understand, okay, well now I live in this kind of this corrupted world and we're at a certain point in seeking freedom. We didn't actually lose it. We just never had it. We were propagandized to think that we had it. I mean, we've had, we do have more freedom, more rights in a lot of places in the world. Um, all right, now, so the, the, my talk was context and consequences. So let me talk a little bit about consequences. I was talking to somebody recently about you know, drugs and side effects of that, and he says, no, there's no such thing as side effects. I go, what do you mean? He says, it's all effects. It's not something that happens accidentally. It's, it's what the drug does to your body. It's just one of the list of things that it does to your body. So when we talk about doing some sort of activism and, you know, as a side effect, we get arrested or something like that, I say, no, it's not a side effect. It's, it's one of the consequences. It's one of the things that is involved in the whole, uh, the whole act. <coughs> so... When um, a friend of mine was sent to jail for a year, uh, you know, partly for being stupid about driving and all that, but um, uh, another friend of mine was trying to write him or send him a book or something like that, and they wouldn't let him send in the book. And he got all incensed. He says, uh, they're taking away his rights. And I said, well, yeah, that's what they do. That's what the purpose of jail is, is to take away your rights. He says, yeah, but they can't do that. I says, Oh, yeah, they can. They, they do that all the time. That's what they do. That's their job. He says, yeah, but they're taking away... No. He, he, does, he loses that right because, you know, the, the violation he was convicted of, whether it's right or wrong. I, I was just trying to get to the guy to understand that this is a real consequence. It's, it's something that should have been considered <laughs> earlier on in the process that... Yeah, they wouldn't let it. You can actually, uh, you know, you can read online what's allowed, what you can send a prisoner and all that. And yes, the prisoner has lost rights, lost, lost his liberty right, like I said earlier. 
So when you when you get involved in you know what to do, I want to take some kind of action. Um, all of this um, activism has costs. All right, so sometimes the costs are just the gas to drive somewhere. Um, you know, the time you spend that you could have been spending doing something else. If you get involved in something that challenges the legal system, then you've got legal costs, and if you get incarcerated, you've got that loss of, you know, time and freedom and however you want to evaluate that cost. So we actually have to um, look at pursuing activism, you know, when we're trying to figure out what to do about the situation in our world that we can essentially afford to bear the cost of. Um, if you do something that, you know, is more than you can afford, you know, people lose their marriages, people lose their their houses, um, they get, you know, put in jail and put their stuff in storage and they lose everything in storage. There are, there are costs and if the costs are too great, it can take you out of uh, out of action as a player in the, or as an activist. And so, you know, context and consequences. Are you um, understanding the context that you're operating in and are you understanding the, the consequences? Now, I'll give some examples and I don't want to be uh, critical of anybody, but I, I just want to use these examples because they're current. But um, there was a recent thing where someone wore a hat in court um, they were told to take it off. I got to watch the video again. I forgot uh, exactly the sequence of things. But anyway, they got arrested because they were in a hat in court. Then everybody um, is all upset, and you know uh, he's in jail. Oh, this is horrible. It's all over the internet and all that. And a buddy goes to court, and he gets so mad that he swears at the judge and uh, and is. Uh, acts in a way that they don't like in the courtroom and he gets thrown in jail. Now everybody's doubly upset and so if you go back to the context page here, um, what's the context that we really live in? They're saying, oh they're taking away our rights, they can't tell us we can't wear a hat in court and um, this is America, we've got rights. I'm going like, didn't you guys get the memo? You know, it's it's not um, that that we're on an equal peer with the judge. Part of our context is there is a class system here. The judge does have more authority than us. He, he may not have it by right, but he has people there that have guns and badges and jails and all that who will do what he says if he issues an order to jail someone for contempt. So that's really the context. And the whole thing about hats goes back to... Um, the class system in England uh, because our, our judicial system kind of derives from England and I don't want to cover this if you're going to cover it Mark about uh, uh, the Quakers were, were this one group that that decided or that in their study uh, they felt that all men were um, equal before God and so they they wouldn't take their hat off to someone of higher social rank and, and the way it was in England was you know, the king could keep his hat on at all time. No, he didn't have to take off his hat to anybody. But the next lower rank, um, which would be... Knights, earls, dukes? I think duke is next. But anyway, a duke would have to take his hat off to a king. An earl would have to take his hat off to a duke and, you know, down the line. And a commoner would have to take off his hat to everyone. And so in court, the, the judge was essentially acting as a um, substitute for the king. So... Essentially, everybody takes off uh, their hat when they go into the courtroom, and it's and it's just part of this English system of law. The Quakers in um, kind of came into being in about 1654. Somewhere along the way, they they took this position that they wouldn't take off their hats, and they got sent to jail. They got uh, some of them died in jail. Uh, things were pretty bad, and. Uh, I think it was 43 years or something like that until the Parliament passed the Religious Toleration Act. And that, that was one of the things that where the Quakers and some of their beliefs got accepted. And so finally, um, the Quakers could follow their practice of not taking off their hat uh, to people of higher rank and in court. Now, the understanding the context... Um, this recent case where the guy didn't take off his hat, he probably didn't know about a case like two years before another libertarian goes into the in the court in Milford District Court and he was going there in support of somebody else. It was a cold day, he had on a stocking cap and uh, 
the bailiff, as he's walking in the room, the bailiff says, take off your hat. And he says, well, I don't want to take off my hat. And the bailiff says, take off your hat. You have to take off your hat in court. And he says, no, I don't, I, I don't believe that. And so some point along the way, the judge, the judge walks in. It was Martha Crocker. She was the judge of the Milford District Court. She said, is that a religious belief? And he says, no, I just don't think I should have to take off my hat. And then she says, sit down and take off your hat. But what she had done was given him the chance. But he didn't, he didn't understand his historical context. If he had said, yeah, that's my religious belief that all men are created equal before God. And she says, okay, please have a seat. And that's what she would have said. And I think she was um, knowledgeable enough about our context in the court system that she knows that you know, for 300 and some odd years the Quakers have taken that exception and the courts finally decided to quit killing the Quakers over that one. Uh, a couple of things by being a Quaker. Essentially, it's like they're just not worth dealing with. And, yeah, yeah. These guys are so determined. to be nuts. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, what, do we, what do libertarians have? A few decades of nuts. Yeah. So. Well, and they also don't have God on their side. Um, so I think I might have gotten off on a tangent there. Um, well, you know, I, I said I was against liberty. Uh, that's because I'm for freedom and liberty is just too limiting. So let's look at the freedom thing. It's, it's actually, it appears to be a universal desire. Um, it's international. You know, it's not just an, an American thing. But it's usually, we usually see the desire for it more in countries where people who've lost it or have little of it. And so... The examples in Tunisia, Egypt, now Libya, and you had just said North Korea, um, and especially the tenacity of the, the people in Palestine, they, they'll go to great lengths to, um, to, to, to fight for their freedom when they finally um, believe they're in an environment where they can actually um, have an effect. Like, you know, why, why that point in time in Egypt? And I'd like to understand that a little better. Uh, I think in America, I think there's enough prosperity that it lulls people. Even if, you know, you can't call our, our surveillance state and the fact that, you know, the TSA can grab our genitals and <clears throat> that, the, that uh, the IRS can come grab money out of our banks. You can't call that freedom. So we don't have freedom here, but we have enough prosperity that people say, yeah, well, it's okay, I can deal with it. Um, and what they're also not aware of is that some of the prosperity here, you know, some of it comes from entrepreneurship and creativity and all that. Some of it comes from empire, imperial conquest and stealing of other people's oil and things like that. So when we have enough prosperity here, we can be less concerned about other people's freedom, you know, because, geez, if... If we didn't take their oil, my, it would cost me more to drive to the store. And, uh, you slaughter all those people. It costs me so much more. Yeah. So what I, what I observed in the libertarian movement is that most people don't become libertarians you know, from the general population until their own ox is gored. That's a term we used in Texas. But uh, until it hits home to them, you know, like... Uh, for example, the thing that really opened my eyes about this false view I had about the courts, the courts are there to give me justice, was when I went through a divorce and I couldn't get access to even seeing my own kid and all that. And so I finally realized that what the court was, was, was almost like a boxing arena and the judge was like the referee. Because I found out that, you know, there's court rules, the lawyers are not supposed to do this or that and there's rules of evidence. But what really happens is the lawyers will break the rules if they can get away with it. And so it's like you're not supposed to hit below the belt in boxing, but if you can do it when the referee's not looking, you can get away with it and maybe you can win the match. So our present court system is, is, is more like that. Uh, it's more like a boxing arena. Um, and but, oh, but what happens is a whole lot of people. I always thought that we should be recruiting for the libertarian movement outside the doors of the courthouses when people come out. They're at their maximum frustration and anger <laughs> with uh, how the system works. I'll just call it the system. Or outside the DMV, you know, they've stood in line for a half hour, you know, and oh, they got to go home and get another piece of paperwork before this bureaucrat will let them have have their signed slip of paper. So. 
I almost think that that's where we should be recruiting those kind of places. And this gets into something else that's in my my thinking about this, and that is it's it's not as important to have. Um, uh, perfect intellectual understanding of everything as it is to be um, you know angry and ready to take action and you can get the intellectual purity later you know and it doesn't even have to be pure pure um, on the uh, context and consequences thing about Egypt one of the one of the best videos I saw on there was I don't know if everybody saw it, but there was a bridge, and the protesters were on one side of the bridge, and the police were on the other side, and the police are firing tear gas in there, and there were so many protesters. I don't know how many of them were on this bridge. They were pushing back the police. The police even had their big riot vehicles, and they had them in reverse, and they were backing up back down the bridge, and it things had really reached the critical mass there, and. Uh, and we see the results now. Of course, the story of Egypt isn't over, and the you know the military is running it now, and it's probably worse. But I just hope their their freedom movement you know stays alive and 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 can can continue to push for for more freedom there. There was another video that was similar to that. It was last summer, I think, either last summer or summer before last, in Uzbekistan. There was some kind of protest. And I don't even know what they were protesting, but the YouTube video was great because the protesters had were sending the police on the run, and yeah. So with that, in the context and consequences analysis, the the context there is, of course, they have an oppressive government. Both places did. But the context of that moment was they had they had more of them. They had a critical mass where they could actually have an effect. Um, I don't know what their long-term consequences are or are going to be, but in Egypt, they they toppled Mubarak and uh, threw a big kink in the establishment's plans there. So, so we, we were able to look at the context and consequences a little better now. So, what do we do um, in the libertarian movement? My observations from you know 1969 forward are that there's a whole bunch of different approaches and strategies that people have used. Um, the reason I mentioned that 69 was a big year was that there was this um, coalescing of some of the, the radicals from the um, Young Americans for Freedom, which was sort of this right-wing conservative group that was started by William F. Buckley. But they were kind of against the war and they were okay with uh, uh, you know, marijuana use and that kind of thing, whereas the mainstream of their movement was okay with the war and promoted it. There was the Students for Democratic Society, and there was a bunch of them that were not in favor of uh, communism. Uh, there was a whole big Trotskyist infiltration of the movement, which originally started out for free speech on campus and against the draft. So in 1969, uh, folks from both of those movements met, and they, it was kind of like considered the birth of the modern libertarian movement. And Murray Rothbard and Carl Hess were both real involved in that. And as I understand it, they're the ones that kind of uh, kind of were looking for a name for this movement and came up with the word libertarian. And in April of '69, I think it was uh, April, uh, Carl Hess got an article published in Playboy. It was called "The Death of Politics." So the, the origins of the libertarian movement was um, anti-political. They, they identified politics as the problem. So politics is a system where um, essentially you can have your rights taken away from you if enough people agree to it, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so one of the approaches that came along within the libertarian movement which was really controversial then and it's not as controversial now and that is to get involved in politics, to be opposed to politics. And so there was actually a, a libertarian party formed, I think in 1970 in California, and it, and it was a joke, because they said, of course we're not going to do that. That's just ha ha ha, fun fun. L little uh, play on words here, we'll, uh, we'll just have a big joke. But then a year later, uh, Dave Nolan started the libertarian party that, that survives to this day. and. Uh, some of the people in the libertarian movement were horrified. They thought, this is terrible. They're taking us back into politics, which is the thing we're opposed to. 
So early on, and I got to observe some of this um, in New York back in the 70s, there was, um, there was a lot of debate back and forth, and there was uh, the fellow that, that I, I met him at the laissez-faire bookstore when it was located in New York City, Samuel Edward Conkin, or Sam Conkin, um, he organized within the party, he joined the party and organized a radical caucus to, so they could hold a vote to disband the party. That was the, the goal of, that was the strategy of how to do this. And they may not have had like a really firm uh, direction at that time. And in fact, I think one of the actions that some of the real radicals wanted to do was to, they were going to organize in New York and get a bus and they were going to go to Fort Dix uh, in New Jersey, an army base, and somehow they were going to attack this army base. This is going to be like uh, John Brown at Harper's Ferry or something. And I, I, didn't, I didn't hear what the real goal of that action was because it really kind of fizzled. Everybody got cold feet and of course it was a wacky idea. Um, so, uh, so there was a lot of different things uh, tried. I don't think early on there was as much civil disobedience, but there was a, a tax resistance movement, and there were people that were fighting the right to travel issues and things like that. There was the thing that I got into, uh, which I call the fight everything strategy. Well, it's not really a strategy. It's just the anger coming out wherever anything comes at you. And so I gave you the, um, the consequences of the fight everything strategy. Essentially, it, um, it totally depletes all your emotional energy, all your money, all your time. You know, pretty soon you're, um, you can't focus on your work, your family, relationships, anything, because you've you got to write your next court brief, you know, and you've got you know, you to pay a certain fine by a certain day or they're going to arrest you, and, and your life gets completely embroiled in that. So I, I call that not a strategy, because a strategy is when you carefully think out and you have a plan. And the fight everything approach um, just... Um, it's non-strategic. The reason for a strategy is so, so you can be effective, so you can use the resources you have to accomplish something. Uh, one other approach is education and the arts. So there were, you know, within the objectivist movement, there was the uh, Nathaniel Brandon Institute when they split up. Um, she still had her newsletters and things like that. There was the Freeman. Um, there was all kinds of things that sprung up. There was all kinds of writing. So, of all these approaches, uh, the guy I follow again, Sam Conkin, he was uh, if he w he was opposed to the party, and people would ask him, "Well, then, what do you think we should do?" So along the way, um, he developed. Uh, a strategy and it's laid out in the New Libertarian Manifesto and he calls it the New Libertarian Strategy. So we have a couple of copies of this downstairs but the strategy starts later on in the book after he basically explains everything I think on page 54 and he lays out a step-by-step -step approach which I'll get into. Um, now one of the things we're going to talk about at the very end here is again of all these different approaches what's our metric how do we measure success and I'll just say a little bit about that like in electoral politics you have all kinds of metrics um, let's say you decide to run for office the first thing you do is you gotta get a lot of signatures on a petition so that's something you can measure you go like oh, I've gotta get 50 signatures I only have 37 I have to go out and beat the streets you know get more signatures when I get 50 that's really not enough because the town clerk is going to strike down a few of them, so I have to get a 30% more, so maybe i got to get uh, 65. I gotta, so there's a number. And then you go out and you campaign and you got to raise some money. So you raise, okay, I raised uh, $473. That means I can buy uh, 300 uh, pamphlets and uh, 40 yard signs. And then I got uh, seven volunteers, and so there's like all these measurements. And finally, the ultimate metric if you're a candidate is how many votes did you get and of course I got 51 percent of the votes I got 371 the other guy got 350 then even when you get into office oh yeah and I forgot the polling metrics there's you know polls you, they're taken then once you get into office um, 
there's, um, I'm in a caucus and there's 17 people in my caucus and then we're going to introduce bill number 473 and then we're going to have a committee meeting with 15 members and I got six people to testify and it's numbers, numbers, numbers. So how do we measure our freedom and how do we measure how effective these actions are? So for example, um, you know, an educational approach you usually have to have fundraisers, or if, you're, or if you have a bookstore, you can measure your sales. So I just want to let that sink in for a while. How do we measure our success? Um, and I'll get back to just one recommendation I have on that. Um, the um, in the 70s, then there was this again this fight over whether to have a voting system or not. And you know, some of you may believe in that. Um, in the New Libertarian Manifesto, he, he says, you know, if we're really going to get to a free society where people don't violate each other's rights, we really have to be consistent. We have to be objectively libertarian in our actions. Uh, now, what that means is, you know, the voting system is a system where a majority of people can vote to violate the rights of the minority. So, that happens all the time and essentially... Uh, you can look at a vote as authorizing the actions of everybody in that system and that's, that includes the cops that, that beat somebody. If you voted for them, you're essentially giving them your consent to do that. Now there's a lot of argument back and forth about whether, um, whether you and I agree about that or not, but, but I take that position. and. Uh, so, so if the goal is to figure out, okay, now how can we take some action that's going to make us more free and, it, and how can we do something that's objectively libertarian um, and will actually work? That's another thing about voting is will people ever vote for freedom? Uh, right now with a corrupted system where there's uh, money that comes from interest groups and all that, Will they ever um, give any money to a guy that's pro-freedom who won't vote favors for the drug companies or this or that? Um, will they ever um, actually let libertarians get elected? Everybody saw how you know Ron Paul got sabotaged by by the media by just not covering him, things like that. And then the ultimate is um, a lot of people think that the establishment essentially owns the voting machine companies and controls the software that goes into them so that the voting machines can actually be hacked and that even if a libertarian won, they'll you know, change the numbers. So, uh, and Emma Goldman, the famous anarchist, even, even said um, if voting could change anything, they'd make it illegal. You know, they, they just wouldn't allow it. Um, and, it, and it's my belief that actually uh, the voting, the, the system is, the, the democratic systems are to actually get you to consent. Because, you know, in the, in the United States founding documents, they talk about the consent of the government governed. And so once you've consented, then you sort of like don't have a right to complain. And it's sort of opposite what a lot of people say. They say if you don't vote, you don't have a right to complain. Yeah, I actually believe that if you vote, you don't have a right to complain because you you essentially are saying I agree to abide by the outcome, even if the other guy gets elected. Um, so what can we do that's that's consistently libertarian? And so you know what libertarians believe in is freedom, freedom to trade, to buy and sell what you want. So Sam Conkin comes up with a, with a theory and with a, a strategy that he calls agorism. Agora is the Greek word for market or marketplace. So he says what we really need to do is build our free marketplace even though we live in a society that's corrupted with this evil statism that believes that, you know, that people don't have rights and that we should control and regulate everything essentially to feed this powerful oligarchy. Um, if you if you look at um, all the trade in, um, that goes on now, every transaction is taxed, and the money from us, the people who actually worked uh, to you know to earn our our money, our, earn our livings, and to buy our food and all that, the tax system actually takes a little bit out of each transaction and feeds it upstream to the oligarchy. So. 
if we can actually operate in a in a free and fair manner with our fellow men and actually make sure they get paid 100% of what they bargain for, we're actually uh, building the prosperity of our community and essentially starving out the, the statists. So a couple of the other um, benefits would be if you're engaged in free trade and you're actually um, not having as much taken from you in taxes or not being made less efficient through regulation, you should be more prosperous in the end. And um, if you look at um, building the free economy through agorism uh, as a chart of our, our net worth individually and as a community, every time we have a freer trade, our prosperity goes up. Um, if you look at some of the legal approaches and civil disobedience, every time you take another action, your prosperity goes down. You have more costs. You have the, all the court costs, the fines and penalties and things like that. Now, why does that matter? You say, gosh, I'm, I want to fight them because it's the right thing. You have, to, you have to stay in the game to win. You know? And if you, like I did back in the 70s, if you uh, c consistently lose every battle, which is kind of going to happen in the, most of the legal system, your prosperity goes down and down, and eventually you're out of the game for a while. And so th this happens in politics, too. In politics, all those steps cost money. Now, hopefully you can do fundraising and all that. But every time you, you raise all this money and you run a campaign and you don't get elected and you don't have any effect, you're, you know, the prosperity of you and your community goes down. Um, so it's a, it's a path for, to burnout. Like I got involved in the Libertarian Party in 1972 and I voted for John Hospers and he got this one electoral vote and everything. So it was like a huge victory for the Libertarian Party. And, but I don't think there's been anything near that level of success since. And I've seen like dozens if not hundreds of people you know, essentially burn out and eventually say it's not going to work. And then they just sort of go back into the system and, and live a life of quiet misery because they just are now cynical and hopeless about things. So if this, if this approach is good, and I want you all to consider it, you can, you can buy a copy of this downstairs or you can read it online. Uh, if, if we build the prosperity of our movement, we're going to be able to survive more attacks on our movement. If we build the prosperity of ourselves and our communities, well, you know, frankly, we'll just be able to do more. Um, and we'll be able to survive. So if you look at the real worst case scenario, uh, you know, if the currency essentially uh, crashes and destroys everybody's ability to trade and you, you see the, the, the way the system is used, they pump up the economy, everybody gets deeply in debt to buy a house, they contract the, the money supply and credit, and they, they have these, what, what do they call it, robo foreclosures now, they have this rocket docket where they're in, I think it was in Tampa or something like that, they were handling 200 foreclosures a day just by signing, signing, and they weren't reading any of them. And there was a, a case in Massachusetts where they, uh, I think they threw all those out, and they're going to have to do it right this time. But anyway, if, if our only, um, if we're faced with a survival situation like that, and we've already built a network of trade, you know, with our community uh, of freedom lovers, and also within our community of people that live near us, we'll be able to more, uh, we'll be more survivable in a case of a uh, crash of the uh, economy. And sometimes the free market is uh, the only choice for people to get things. And I'll give the example, and Sam mentions it in this book. And he's got another book called The Agorist Primer, which we have downstairs. In the, in the USSR, they had what they call the Nalevo economy, which is named left-hand economy. And uh, what happened was any time the state had some restriction on something, there would be a black market that would uh, arise to handle people's real needs. And so, for example, um, they had um, you know, food rations, so they had ration stamps or whatever. So there was an, a side economy in swapping ration stamps or using them as a currency to trade for other things. There was a system called BLOT, which was kind of like I, an IOU, but a verbal IOU. I don't know how they ever kept this straight, but 
apparently there you need a signature or permission from a bureaucrat to do anything. And so they, you know, they didn't want to get caught uh, taking a bribe or taking food stamps or ration coupons. So there was a system among the bureaucrats of they would sign something for something, but you owed them something. And that, what you owed them might be a plumbing repair or something like that. If they didn't even have enough uh, currency uh, available to, to do bribes, they had to do it in their head, you know, with IOUs that were, were tracked that way. Um, I think this would be a real interesting study to see how the Soviets survived for 70 years. But um, a guy I know was, was in Moscow recently, and I asked him to ask around, because he knew this one guy who was a journalist, and um, ask about the Nalevo economy and find out if there's any books on it and all that. Well, it turns out since the fall of the Soviet Union, there's still an underground economy because they still have a pretty powerful state in Russia, and there's, there's now even the Russian mafias and various different other things. So they still... They don't want to talk about it because it's still an active underground economy. So we'll see if we can get more information on that, and I'll report that out. So anyway, in the philosophy of agorism and in the strategy of agorism, there's, uh, he mentions that if we're going to get from here to freedom, we're going to go through uh, several phases. And I think he lists... Um, he says phase zero is most of human history where there's, there's nobody... Uh, that knows about the ideas of freedom. And he says, or maybe you're the only one. So you're still in phase zero. So your strategy at that phase is find one other guy, you know. And the, when you have two of you, you go into phase one, and your strategy there might be to, you know, set up a table at an event and try to recruit and find some more people. Then as you get more and more people, you go into phase two, and you might be able to have a small um, economy. And phase three, you're probably going to start coming under attack. Uh, and essentially in phase four, you become strong enough that you can survive attacks from the statists or whatever. So this is a, this is a serious strategy. Um, he also points out that you don't really want to go up against the state in these earlier phases because you're just not powerful enough. And that's why I bring up the example of some of the activism that goes on now where people just get crushed versus the situation in Egypt where the, where the protesters are pushing the police back. They reach the stage where they're powerful enough to do that. Um, right now in 2011, we're not powerful to push back a lot of that, so we actually need to recruit more. And the Free State Project is a really great thing uh, for bringing people to New Hampshire. Um, what, one of my recommendations is also going to be we need to, we need to learn to work together better, but that's, that's a whole other thing. Um, so in Agorism, what we did in New Hampshire was um, a year ago, um, we started a group called the Shire Agorists where we want to talk about this and flesh this out some more. This is just a manifesto, and what we need to do is work out some of the details of what we're going to do. I'm just going to hit some highlights and not go into any of the, the real details, but I mentioned before we should have a metric uh, for how do we measure freedom. Um, we came up with a concept that isn't uh, really executed yet, but we came up with a thing we called the, the freedom factor. Um, so what you would do is, if, if anybody's ever heard of the carbon footprint, you know, somebody's concerned about the environment, they can log on to this website, and I think it's carbonfootprint.com or .org, and you can go in there and you can self-rate yourself. Uh, you can answer all these questions, and it tells you what your carbon footprint is. So then it also gives you some recommendations of what you should do if you have a big carbon footprint to reduce your carbon footprint. So what, I, what we recommend is a freedom factor thing that would be a, a similar model to the carbon footprint. You go on to, say, freedomfactor.com, and you rate yourself, and... You could, you could sort of, by taking this score, dis discover how free you are, and then maybe there might be some recommendations on what you should do to like, change it. Then if you self-rated like every quarter, you could say, oh, geez, I'm only 27% free. I need to change a few things. So you change a few things. You go back and take the test again, and you go like, all right, I raised myself up to 31.2% free. Um, 
what we didn't go into, we, we came up with this freedom factor as a, a thing that you could rate your individual uh, um, freedom on. Uh, what I think it, it would be nice if we could do is we could somehow uh, expand that to a community. Maybe maybe you rate you know a couple of dozen people in a community and average the score or something like that. Because the goal is for us to increase our freedom. Um, the, the, oh, I'm throwing some of these things out because some of these are projects that you could get involved in. They could be really interesting projects to, to develop. Um, we came up with another concept called the Freedom Fund. And, you know, all these efforts have to be um, financed. And, you know, when somebody gets uh, in, in trouble from their latest CD effort or whatever, they usually start a chip in and they get contributions from all over the Internet. Um, I think of things like um, down in Boston, uh, in a lot of the Irish bars, there's a jar and you chip into that and it essentially goes to the IRA. But, you know, people, it's, it's like a collection in church. You know, you get just a dollar from everybody, but you get $40 if there's 40 people. So it's like some way to make small routine contributions. So I, I was thinking of things like, Maybe I'd have a jar in my car, and when I took the um, the old highway instead of the turnpike, and I saved a dollar, I would contribute the dollar to the Freedom Fund, and essentially it had no financial impact on me. I would have spent that dollar anyway. Uh, maybe if something you saved on taxes would go into the Freedom Fund. Now, like I said, this is a dreamy-eyed concept right now. We don't actually have this Freedom Fund, but I, I want to throw it out as an idea. Um, because, you know, being in the free market is actually risky sometimes. One of the other things we um, developed was what we called uh, safe trading practices. That's got to be developed further too, but, um, you know, having more privacy and granting each other more privacy, um, you know, maybe paying in cash for transactions. You want to develop... Um, you know, uh, some practices that make you safe and make your trading partners safe. Um, and so, there, so there's a problem, like when you make yourself more high profile with civil disobedience actions, you make it less safe for somebody to trade with you. And here's a, one or two particular ways. One is you're, you're on the radar. You're, now you're, the police may be watching you, whatever. Um, they might actually seize your assets. So if I trade with somebody and I give them $100 for something that they're going to go out and purchase, and so let's say that $100 gets seized, um, they may get in jail and not be able to deliver on the delivery date, things like that. So that's something to consider. The, the agorism strategy is different. It's actually uh, completely opposite of CD. And... Um, Here's the reason I say that. There, there's been a popular notion that there's, there's inside the system activism, which is voting and all that, and there's outside the system activism. Well, th this may be a little controversial, but civil disobedience is actually inside the system activism, and here's why. Um, if, you, if you work inside the system and you're trying to change the laws, you're actually sort of at the top of the system. You're trying to vote politicians in, the politicians will go to the legislature, change the laws, and essentially the governor signs it into law and eventually the police enforce it. Civil disobedience is still in the system in that you're at the bottom of the system where you're confronting the police, you're trying to either deplete their resources or get arrested on purpose so you can go to court and prove it wrong in the legal system. So that's inside the system. Agorism is all outside the system. The goal of the agorist is to, is to not get caught, to not have a high profile, to never be in court. And so that's, that's how that's outside and how uh, the counter economy, which is what, what he says essentially our free market is called, uh, is opposite of civil disobedience. <clears throat> so there are some folks that say, uh, yeah, I'm an agorist and I believe in you know, um, fla flaunting the law publicly and all that. Well, all they do is make themselves a high risk to essentially lose all their assets and not be able to complete their transactions with other agorists. Um, 
one of the other things uh, the Shiragorists have done is we're working on how do we build trading networks? How do we... Um, Right now, there's several different um, people working on software packages to enable, you know, more private trading. Um, we'll see which one of them, you know, gets published and released. I've seen uh, some some um, trade networks uh, on uh, Facebook and other places too. Um, one of the ways to build a trading network with the rest of the community is, is cooperatives. And so some of the Shire Goris folks have gotten involved in creating the Shire Co-op, which has just completed its um, second order cycle and uh, is essentially a, a real entity now. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that w what we try to do is we're we're identifying this infrastructure of life and we see all these different areas that are corrupted, you know, the schools, the banking and all that. So what we're trying to do is uh, encourage people to actually create alternatives uh, to the mainstream system that's totally corrupted, support the alternative enterprises that are already out there by patronizing them and buying their products. Um, we'll have a lot more on that as time goes on. And what we're trying to also do is actually build our movement of other folks that, that believe in the Agora as a, as a practice, Agorism as a practice. So one of the things we do is uh, th there's what's called the alternatives community strategy. If we identify all these different communities, like the health food uh, group, the people that are concerned about the pollution of the food chain, uh, they actually have a very active community of creating an alternative through organic growing and sales of organic natural products. So we, I think, want to be working with them to patronize and trade with them, but we also want to be talking to them about the libertarian uh, philosophy more. They may or may not have a philosophy, but again, it's like any community where their own ox is being gored, they're a better candidate for a libertarian philosophy than just the man on the street. So one of the things we do is we have actually uh, put together a tour to a whole bunch of different um, organizations. We call it the Alt Orgs Tour. It stands for Alternatives Organizations. And there's, uh, oh, we have folk, some, some of them are just fun things. We have the Lowell Folk Festival, but here's a um, kneading conference. Here's for independent bread makers. Uh, there's some things that are kind of left libertarian, some that are right libertarian. We've got the taxpayers picnic. Um, where is it? Somewhere on here is the New York City Anarchist Book Fair. Um, there's the Alternative Energy Conference in Boston. So I have a few of these schedules, and I, and I can give you the website too. You may, especially if you're new to the state and you don't know the area, you join in on the tour. We'll take you around and, and show you some of the alternatives communities. Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about the Shire Agoras is we're working on how do you run a micro business or, or how do you do a micro project. And I'll give you a couple of um, a couple of ideas. Uh, a few years back, my daughter was in college in Boston, and it turns out all the students move on Labor Day. That's when their leases are up and their new leases start. So Labor Day weekend is this whole huge shuffle. And I had wanted to buy this truck for my business, so what we did was three of us went down to Boston and put up cards everywhere in the college areas, and we started a, a weekend-long business called Student Movers. And so we would move students from one place to another. So we worked really hard for three days. Um, and we, we created a business that we started on Thursday and we closed on Sunday night, you know. Uh, another micro-business idea, I call this, you know, building the economy starting at the lemonade stand is, and, and I brought the, in my car I have this little kit which is the lemonade making kit. And what happens is at, at big events in the summer, fairs and festivals, people are, um, they're thirsty, you know. Gosh, lemonade looks really good, even if you're charging like three bucks a glass, you know, for fresh squeezed lemonade. And it turns out, I had the idea first and then I asked around, this, this friend of mine uh, knows a guy that brings home like 5,000 bucks from a festival from just selling lemonade. So that could actually be more than just a roadside stand for kids. It could be actually a way to make a decent amount of money. I've seen another guy that, that sells uh, coffee at festivals. He's got a trailer he pulls up. He's got a coffee business. 
he always has a line, you know, like of a dozen people or so to buy a $2 cup of coffee at an event where there's nobody else selling coffee. And I calculated it once, and now I don't remember the number, but, you know, he'd work hard for three days straight selling $2 cups of coffee as fast as he could. And, I don't know, it was an outrageous amount of, of, of revenue anyway. So, just, just to kind of wrap up, I have uh, some recommendations. If I'm, if I'm saying that um, agorism is good and maybe civil disobedience has costs that some people can't sustain, and it may not have a, oh, I didn't get into the, met- well, the, the freedom factor. If we could somehow measure our results from any of our actions, how do we become more free by these actions? Um, I'd, I'd like to see that and use that as almost like an accounting for the freedom movement. Um, I believe that what we should be doing is building a long-term, sustainable freedom movement. And agorism uh, would help that by, by showing people how to actually make money in it, how to promote freedom to other people, and actually build the movement and become more prosperous all along the way and lose less of our resources to... Um, to legal struggles and things like that. Um, We have to make the freedom movement actually survive through some of the challenges that we're going to see in the future and revenue production. That's the other thing I mentioned here. But we also have to make sure that that we have safety and security and that gets into privacy and you know being able to communicate with each other. Um, Building the cadre and the community the cadre is kind of like, you know, we're, we're kind of the intellectual leaders, the idea leaders, and we need to invite more people into that and encourage their creativity too. Um, and sometimes that means we have to look at our, at our mission as we're not here to just argue with each other and be perfect, you know. We're here to actually do stuff. Um, like I said earlier, I, th- I think uh, ideas don't matter, and what I mean by that is we want to see actions result. In other words, some people I think within the movement look at winning the argument as being, that's our activism, we want to be better arguers, and now we have a victory when we win the argument. Well, we've still gone nowhere, and sometimes we've broken down the community more by just creating ill will. And then one of the other things would be great. We, we have a lot of aid and support that goes on now, like new movers, some people will help them unload, uh, people do go to court, people show up for them. That's, that's really awesome. We, we don't have it fleshed out in uh, areas like, um, I mean, I'd eventually, well, we, we have Pork 411, like if somebody breaks down on the road, you know, they call and they can get a ride. That stuff is really awesome. Uh, the the, you know, I suffered a real um, health challenge a few years ago, and essentially, the it, it's hard to come back when you're completely on your own. So luckily, I had some family support and things like that. But some people move here and don't have uh, family. I, I keep thinking of this thing I used to hear in, in Hollywood. Uh, there's a there's a, a retirement home for old actors, you know. So, you know, gosh, maybe we want a retirement home for old activists or something like that. And that would be something that we would support, that it wouldn't end up being a a state thing. Um, Well, I have so much more to say, and I'm at the end of my notes, so I'm going to call it a a stop there. So, yeah. I've got a question. Um, Sure. Since I'm next, I can take it along as we want to answer this. Okay. Um, (laughs) So you were... I found this very motivating, what you said regarding the, uh, you know, the inside the court system activism depleting your wealth, right. whereas agorism increases your wealth. Right. But, um, you know, sort of the, you know, the model of economics as things exist today is people specialize in areas of labor in order to make themselves more wealthy, and that uh, trying to do everything at once makes people less wealthy. And this is a conversation I have with a good friend of mine who's, uh, uh, you know, sort of very far outside the act of the system. He wants to create his own self-sustained farm. Right. And um, 
At my house, we have these uh, these chickens, which must cost about fifty dollars a pound, but they're completely free, right? <laughs> Except for maybe the taxes that have gone, um, you know, for the land on which the chickens uh, live, and then some food to feed them during the winter and things like that. So I can go to the grocery store and I can buy a chicken for fifty cents a pound, whereas right. I can have chickens at my house for fifty dollars a pound. Yeah. Well, you know, they, <laughs> these are moral chickens, right? And so, like, there's a there's a cost to the agorism in and of itself. Have I made myself clear? Um, yeah, I, th- I think the question really is: Is agorism the same thing as uh, full self-sufficient survivalism? And it's not. And what Konkin pointed out, he was actually opposed to things like um, the Free State Project. He called that an anarcho-Zionism. He says you can be free where you are. And so he doesn't advocate moving to the country. He says move to the city because that's where the trade and commerce is. So agorists actually operate in the interstices or the gaps in the system. Um, agorists exist where there's, there's opportunity. I, I wrote up a whole sheet on this. I don't have it with me. But... Um, so self-sufficiency is a different thing, and it, in a lot of cases, doesn't make economic sense, like you're saying. However, if you're looking at a system where um, there's going to be an economic collapse and the food chain might break down and, there, and gas prices might be so high that they can't truck in uh, you know, lettuce from California and fly in you know, lemons from Chile or something like that, it might be good to have the skills to grow the things that you need. So I, I look at some of the self-sufficiency things as like training in case I need it sometime or you know, skills I would like to have. So as I'm able to, I you know, try to increase my skill set. But you know, as of today, the dollar is still negotiable. And you know, to be more free, I'd probably want to move more of my assets into silver and gold and things like that. And if we actually had an accounting system to measure how free we were, somehow that would um, that would account for like prosperity and our our grocery costs and our political freedom and things like that. We don't have that yet. I mean, I'd love to see this freedom factor thing, you know, catch on. But no, agorism is not the same thing as survivalism or self sufficiency. Self sufficiency. Yeah. Uh, actually, on the way over, Mark and I were talking about, I mentioned the idea of incremental agorism. Yeah. Like, you know, politics likes to talk about incremental progress, and uh, I'm outside of politics myself. I tend to agree with you for the most part. And, um, and I was looking at agorism, and, you know, Mark brought up, well, agorist trade between people, almost inevitably, the, the, the products they got came out of the, the white market, where there's all kinds of embedded taxes and things like that. Right. Um, and I was thinking about, what about somebody, for instance, who, uh, um, you know, like the, the guy that put in my boiler was recommended to me. He's in the yellow pages. He probably files taxes every year and stuff like yeah. that. But I know, like, we're talking and everything. I paid him cash. He said, cash, awesome. You know? And, uh, and he goes right in his you know, pocket, dude, right? <laughs> cash and handshakes, I'm all for it, you know? Yeah. And I, you know, so I, I have a feeling that, that, you know, the cash I paid, what, 90 bucks to clean my boiler or whatever, uh, it's probably not going to be on his taxes this year, and it's outside the white market. It's you know, so he's like partially agorist, but at the same time, like, to be completely hidden and discreet, he's trying to be a purist agorist. No one's going to know he does his work. He's going to you know, he's going to tell the wrong person, and that person's going to turn him in or something like that. Whereas he's doing this sort of. Let me answer and, him and, uh, and first. I'm curious how you feel about that kind of increment. You know, someone who's kind of in the system because they're going to get in a lot of trouble if they don't, but at the same time they're trying to work toward agorism. You're just saying something I just forgot to put in there. That's perfect. I, I totally agree with you. I call it the transition, but incrementalism is like another way to put it. And for example, let's say we had this freedom factor, way to rate our freedom. That would sort of be accounted for in there. It's like... Um, you know, you buy a, kind, a product and it says, uh, you know, so-and-so percent post-consumer waste. Well, what if we had um, uh, products, like I, I always talk about this example. I said, I'll know we're there if when I look at the bottom of the coffee mug, it says made in the free market by free men you know, and women. And <laughs> but if we, um, it, you know, it might, right now it might say... Um, uh, 10% free market content, 90% state state controlled or whatever. So yeah, if we could look at a way to like go more that direction, because there's not there's not options for everything we need right now that are all made in the free market. 88% free market. Oh, there you go. State control. Get your Jane hats here. <laughs> it looks to me like the only way that that agorism is going to be 
doing it, the black market or whatever you want to call it, free market, can prosper is by having this this front, you know, like like because the only, the reason the black market was so successful in Russia was because there was this front that was the state-run stores, the state-run everything. Um, <clears throat> It's like it's like everybody you know, like people who say, oh, well, I I have a safe where I keep one gun and some silver, so when they come, I can give them that because that way they won't find my real stash. You know, it's like the, the way that the agorism prospers is by having this front for uh, for legitimate commerce, so that I, the guys with the guns won't take away the the real stuff. Uh, yeah, this is. Um it's like, you know, we can't knock ourselves for having driven here on a state-run road. Because there's no other option. You know, we would have to just stay home if we were going to stay completely free of using the state roads. And you have to stay home because you got to pay taxes in your house, so but for, live out in the wilderness. But, for example, a guy could run an agorist uh, taxi business using the state-run roads. So what he's, he's doing is, okay, there's a law against, you know, you having a private taxi business, but you can do it anyway because they, they can't enforce everything. In New York City, they call those gypsy cabs, and they had unmarked, you know, cabs, and, and, you know, your local barber or something would tell you how to get one, you know, something like that. Um, hmm? You could have walked across country to get one. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, and the, the thing is that we have, you know, a room full of really creative people, and we can even create some alternatives that we haven't thought of. But, but you're right. There's, there's not going to be a hundred percent agorist content, and we are going to be operating in a world that's still largely populated by statists and state-run institutions and things like that. And so this is a challenge for us. We got to figure the path to freedom, given the context. The desire for tourism stifles a lot of people trying to do this because they don't feel like it's okay to maybe have a business that's official but do some agorist stuff. And, and then, you know, again, if you don't have that sort of official front, like you said, then you can't really advertise, you can't get the word out that you're doing stuff. And it's time that people don't want to get dirty. You know, they don't want to get dirty in that way. I don't either, but it feels like... There's, there's, there's stuff in here. Um, he, he talks about there's people that are actually sort of acting free market right now but they feel guilty about it, you know, because they don't have the on the other side the intellectual uh, education about that it's actually morally right to do it. So agorism tries to get together the people that are in the free market with the intellectuals, and it encourages the the people that are in the free market now to learn more about that it's morally correct, and it encourages the intellectuals to also get more into the free market. I actually met people feeling dirty because they did state stuff. Oh, okay. No, the best thing to do is improve a little bit every day. Will? What stage do you think we're currently in here in New Hampshire in terms of the conference? Uh, you know, oh, I think we're in phase one. Uh, phase zero is when there's nobody else. Um, and sometimes I feel like I'm in phase zero. But uh, we're, we're, the reason I'm speaking here is to try to move us more into phase one. Um, I'll have to... Um, I was going to bookmark these pages, but phase, phase zero, he calls it zero density agorist society. I'll just read this because it's kind of funny. In this phase, most of human history, no agorists exist. Only scattered libertarians or proto-libertarian thinkers and practicing counter-economists. The moment someone reads this manifesto and wishes to apply it, we have moved to the next phase. <laughs> yeah. Um. Now, I'm not going to claim to be a, a person who believes that agorism is the answer. I certainly I don't believe that. But, um, You're banished. No. I, <laughs> I, I grow my own food, a great deal of it. Yeah. Chickens in my house. I eat their eggs. I uh, trade on a regular basis with people in my community that in silver um, in order to you know, not pay taxes on it. I, uh, you know, I, I make concerted efforts on a regular basis not to... 
uh, you know, give extra money to the beast. We're at phase one where I'm looking for somebody to trade with. No, by no means is that the case. I mean, I have several people with which to trade. I get all yeah. kinds of goods and services from them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, outside of the system. So I, we've got to be beyond one. Well, let me see here. <laughs> I mean, you got your, you got your Shire co-op up and running. I mean, people are buying stuff. I mean, admittedly, it isn't pure agorism, nothing is. Oh, At this point, very little. All right, well, one of the other concepts, and this isn't in the book, this is in from personal conversations and some other things. He talked about the tips of the iceberg. He says sometimes, you know, the, most of the counter economy is unseen, so it's like an iceberg where 90% of it's underwater. You just see the tip of it. So, um, we can talk some. Right now, we're being videotaped. And I'll, I'll talk after the talk about some other things. But there's uh, this, the guy that has the the burner service business that, and he's in the yellow pages. That's the tip of the iceberg. Let's say he doesn't have 90% of his under the radar. I mean, I I pay people in cash to mostly to give them the opportunity to make a free choice about what they do with it. Um, so. For everybody, they've got a, a foot in and a foot out of the system, and you know even even government bureaucrats like who was it that got appointed as attorney general and she had to back out because she wasn't paying social security for her housemaid or whatever. Yeah, it's been a long time. So even 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 government bureaucrats have a foot in and a foot out, and uh, a lot of times. Charlie Rangel's got a whole leg in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, what happens is um, that's the problem with being in the state system and, and being under the public eye is that some of them are going to get caught and they're going to lose their, their job because of it. You know, um, I, I don't have all the answers. It's just that um, if we had a, a way to measure it, and again, I don't have the brilliant answer to this, but like some kind of freedom factor. And if it was based on principles that we really believed in uh, that, that made us free and we could rate ourselves, we could... We're not going to get from zero to 100 percent from today to till tomorrow. They're just we don't have all the options. But we, the, you know, the people that have moved here, some people say, "Oh, this is going to be hard." Well, some people walked all the way across the country to get here. You know, <laughs> I'm sure that was hard. And you know, buying eggs from your local organic farmer who's who's in the counter economy is harder than going to buy it at Market Basket. But you've already proved you're willing to do something that's hard. So just like keep realizing that we're in a struggle that's going to have a lot of difficulties. We're not, you know, you know, as a free stater to move to New Hampshire and say, I'm done. We, we're free now. I'm in a free state. You reached the starting line. That's right. That's, that's it. That's the point.